If April showers bring May flowers, what do May flowers bring? Pilgrims. They bring pilgrims. So the question is, is why do fathers take an extra pair of socks when they go golfing? It's in case they get a hole in one. How do you follow Will Smith in the snow? You follow the Fresh Prince. Do you know what kind of music bunny rabbits really like? Hip hop. But do you know what kind of music balloons are afraid of? Pop music. What was the pirate's favorite apple product? The eye patch. Boom. <laughs> so one of my favorites. I love eye jokes. The cornea, the better. <laughs> Did y'all know how a penguin builds a house? It glues it together. What rock band has four guys that don't sing? Mount Rushmore. Anybody remember uh, Billy Madison, that part in Billy Madison where they had the thing and he says, he says, that was the worst thing I've ever heard. We award you no points at all and may God have mercy on your soul. Does anybody remember that? I feel like that's what should be said after watching that video. Our staff really has got to do the, the dad jokes a little better. Um, and I'm glad that I was on vacation this past week, so I wasn't subjected to any of that. Good morning. My name is Dallas. Uh, I am the teaching pastor at our Harrison Bridge campus, uh, and I get the, the privilege of leading uh, our discipleship uh, groups and, and things like that. The church, if I hadn't met you yet, I'm glad to be able to meet you guys this morning. Had a great first service in here um, and I'm just really expecting for God uh, to do something uh, in this second service as well. If you've got a Bible, I want to ask you to go ahead and open with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 is where we're going to be at. Uh, while you're doing that, let me go ahead and say Happy Father's Day to all the dads in the rooms. Uh, my my uh, four-year-old daughter was extremely offended this morning when I had to go to work, right? She said it was a holiday, so that meant I, I got to stay home. So uh, my four-year-old says that after we get done with church today, we can take the rest of the day off, dads, you guys. Uh, I deserve that, okay? Uh, while you're turning there, let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do something a little bit different, at least for me this week. I'm going to uh, pray, and then right after I pray, I'll give us a little context of the passage, and we're going to dive right into the passage to set up where we're going today, okay? So pray with me really quick, and then we'll look at the scripture. God, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity uh, to come back again and study your word. Uh, Father, I just am really expectant right now that you would do a work in this room among your people, Father. God, I pray um, that you would help us hear what we need to hear by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that you would change what needs to be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Work in us and through us to do that even now, Jesus. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see and what your word has for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, Philippians chapter 1. If you've been here the past couple weeks you know that we've been walking through the book of Philippians, right? And, and this is um, a, a fairly unique book out of the Pauline New Testament epistles, right? If you're familiar with the uh, Bible uh, at all in the New Testament, you know that most of the time Paul writes a letter uh, to New Testament believers to correct an issue, right? So if you go back and read like 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians or Galatians, what you find is the apostle Paul is writing a letter to the believers at the church saying, you're doing this wrong now you need to do this instead, right? He's correcting a problem. Well, that's not really the case when we come to Philippians. In Philippians, Paul is not writing to correct. Paul is writing what is a personal letter to what is his favorite church. So this letter almost reads instead of like, uh, instead of a correction, it almost reads like a memoir or a letter to a friend, right? Paul is writing uh, to a close friend. As a matter of fact, Philippians chapter four, verse one, Paul calls this church his crown and enjoy, right? This is his favorite church out of all of his churches that he's planted. So this church is a really, uh, really big deal to Paul. And it's in Philippians chapter one, starting in verse 19, Paul's writing uh, to his friends, letting them know how he's doing. Remember, if, if you were here last week, we talked about the fact that Paul's in prison, right? So he's letting them know how he's doing. And he's, uh, he's 
telling them uh, what his mindset is as he sits in prison and whether it, as he as in his mind he awaits probably the death penalty and he, he we pick up in Rome and Philippians chapter 1 starting in verse 19 he gives us a, a little glimpse into his mindset notice what he says Philippians 1, verse 19, this is what Paul says. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that this, his imprisonment, will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or or by death. So what's he saying? He's saying, I'm in prison, and one thing that I'm confident of is that no matter what happens, my only goal is that Jesus will be honored, whether I live or whether I die. And this causes him to say, verse 21, one of the most popular verses in Scripture, look what it says, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. For me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Verse 22, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two. Listen to this. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Now let's stop right here and, and talk. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to keep reading in just a second. But Paul is writing to the Philippians saying, I don't know whether I'm going to live or whether I'm going to die, but I hope that I'm going to die because I'm ready to go and be with Jesus because that's better, right? Now, can we just acknowledge before we move on how bold of a statement that is? He's like, man, I, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go on and be with Jesus. Like, it, it, most of us would say, like, listen, I love Jesus, I want to be with Jesus, but I'm not ready to go today, right? Everybody, the old saying goes, I'm ready to go to heaven, just don't want to go today, right? That, that's what most of us would be like, yeah, that's me, not Paul. Paul's like, if the bus is on the way, let me catch it, right? I'm ready to go be with Jesus. So we need to see, this is a radical statement. This is a strong statement, okay? Verse 24. But to remain with you, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. What's he saying? You guys still need me. In other words, Jesus still has work for me to do here, so I know that I'm going to remain. Verse 27, he gives them some instruction. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you for that you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but what? also suffer for his sake. Now, we're not going to have time to come back to this particular verse, so I don't want to run away from it now. I want you to notice what the Bible just said. The Bible says that if we are Christians, we will suffer as Christ suffered. Now, that's a big statement because it's a far cry from what we've pretty much accepted in the 21st century church, which is that if you come to Jesus, your life will be better. All right? Your life will be better in the fact that you will have Jesus, but it will not be better in the sense that you're going to be excluded from all suffering, right? Jesus does not come offering health, wealth, and happiness. Jesus comes offering Jesus. He says, if you, he says it has been granted to you that you, for the sake of Christ, should not only believe in him, but also suffer. Verse 30, engaged in the same conflict that, I, that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. So what's going on here? Paul's writing this, uh, this letter, this part of the letter, from prison. And he's describing to the Philippians, right? I told you this is an intensely personal section of Scripture. He's describing in his own terms what it means to be a Christian. So this section here is a, a section of Scripture describing what it means to be a Christian. Now, I want to tell you why this is so important. It's so important for our, uh, especially 21st century mind, because we live in a world that by and large has simplified what it means to be a Christian to the point that we lost a lot of the context of what Paul's saying actually means to be a Christian. 
Does that make sense? Uh, now, simplifying things is not a problem, right? Simplicity, it, 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 it makes it easy to convey. The problem is that when we simplify something, we oftentimes leave out other things that it entails, right? So what, what I mean by that is if I were to come to you, especially, you know, modern Christians, we might say something like this. We've all said it. it's not a bad thing. But if I were to come to you and say, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? You might say, to be a Christian means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? We've all said something to that fact, and that is an absolutely right answer. There's nothing wrong with that answer, except for that it's so simple that it leaves out a lot of what Paul is trying to say it means to be a Christian, right? We might even say things, well, I'm not a religious person, I have a relationship. And now while that conveys an aspect of truth, it does not convey all that Paul is saying it means to be a Christian. Let me give you an example. My wife was in here earlier. Her name's Jenna, and my little four-year-old uh, girl named Danny was in here. And if, I came, if you came to me and said, what does it mean to be married to your wife? I could say it means that I have a relationship with her, right? Now, that is part of what it means to be married to my wife. But if I am to have a happy marriage, that better not be all of what it means to be married to my wife, right? Because what am I leaving out there? Well, part of that relationship, she's just not a relationship I have, right? This out there, and it's, it's, she's okay, I guess. She's nice, right? No, it's not just that I have a relationship with her. It's that I have a relationship where she is the only woman for me, right? That makes sense. I'm leaving something out if I say, I just have a relationship with her. Same thing goes for my little girl, right? If you say, well, what does it mean to be a father? And I say, what well, means that I have a relationship with my little girl? Well, that's leaving out a lot of what it means that I provide for her, that I take care of her, that I see uh, that she is raised and is growing up in a way that honors God, right? I can say, well, it means to have a relationship, but I'm leaving out other things. You see, this is what Paul is doing here. Paul is, in this one section of Scripture, is laying out for us what it means to be a, script, a Christian, and he's challenging us not to leave anything out, right? He, he's going to flesh out this question, what does it mean to be a Christian? So what I want us to do in the next 20 or so minutes is just answer this question. At least right here, what is Paul saying it means to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? And there's really, he answers this question in one sentence, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Read it with me again. I'll make sure it's on the screen. Philippians 1, 21 says this, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's Paul's answer. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. So he answers this question, what does it mean to be a Christian, in one sentence, and it really has two parts to it. I want us to break it down. The first thing we see here, what does it mean to be a Christian? first thing we see is life is Christ. He says, for me to live is Christ. Now, when it, Paul says, what does it mean to be a Christian? He gives us a one-word answer, Christ. And now I, I love the way he, he lays this out for us because check this out. When he said, when the, when the scripture says for me to live is Christ, that's, there's actually a word added there to help with translation. The actual way this text reads, if you could read New Testament Greek, it actually says this, for me, life, Christ. He, he, he's giving a, an exhaustive list almost of what it means in Paul's mind for him to be a Christian. In Paul's mind, the Christian life is summed up with one word, Christ. Now, this isn't an oversimplification. This is meant to be an exhaustive list. list. What Paul is saying is that if I am going to live... If I'm going to have breath in my lungs, if I'm going to continue to wake up each day, here's what my life is going to be about. It's going to be about Jesus. So the, the thing that I, I hope you're beginning to see when we start asking questions, what does it mean to be a Christian? You can say what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But according to Paul here, it's not just that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's that everything in your life is about Jesus Christ. He says, what is life? Life is Christ. He says it's another way in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says it this way there. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice what he's saying. He says, I have been crucified with Jesus. It's no longer I who live. You get that? He's saying, my life, whatever it is, is no longer about Paul. So what's his life about? It's about Jesus. He says, the life that I now live, I live in Christ Jesus. 
You see, everything in Paul's life has become about Jesus. This is what it means to be a Christian. It's not just that you have a relationship with Jesus. It's that Jesus is life to you. It's what all of your life is about. Let me explain it to you a little bit the way Paul explains it. Look at Philippians 1.20. This is what he says. When he, when he, for this idea, okay, life is Christ, what does that actually mean? Paul kind of spells it out for us. What does this actually mean? Ver, one, tw verse 20 in chapter 1 says this, It is my eager expectation. Now, eager expectation, what, is that, what does that mean? Eager expectation, if, if you have an eager expectation, it means that you have a strong and, and passionate expectation that this is how something's going to happen. This is how something's going to play out. You, you're expecting it. He said, it's my eager expectation and what? Hope. So Paul is saying here, he's describing to us an inner longing. Now, what is Paul's inner longing? What does he say? He said, it's my eager expectation and hope, my inner longing, that whether by, that Christ will be honored in my body. So when Paul says that life is Christ, what does he mean? He means that it is his eager hope, his eager longing, it is his passion, might be the best word to sum it up, that if he is going to live, what he is going to live for is to honor Jesus. Paul's saying that this is what it means to be a Christian. That if I'm going to live, I'm going to live to have one passion in all of life to make sure Jesus is honored in my life. So that whether, and how to think about how this applies to us, whether we go to work, whether we're at home, whether we're at the ball field, whether we're at the restaurant, that we live in such a way that our eager expectation, our passion in all of life is living to honor Jesus. So you, you begin to see that Paul's laying out for us here something that's bigger than just, oh, I have a relationship with Jesus. Can I just tell you, you've got a relationship with your hairdresser, right? Jesus isn't coming for just relationship. Jesus is coming for our entire life. He says he wants, it's, Jesus is his one passion. But he also says Jesus is his purpose. Look at, me at Philippians 1.22. Look at what scripture says. He says, if I am to live in the flesh, in other words, if I'm going to continue living, I'm going to what? Verse 22, that means fruitful labor. In other words, if I am going to live, what I'm going to do is work for Jesus. So what we begin to see when Paul says life is Christ, Paul is saying that my entire life is about knowing Jesus, honoring Jesus, and making Jesus known. That what Paul is describing here is a life that everything is about Jesus. It's an all-consuming passion. As I, as, I've been, as I thought about this and even prepared for this week, this is something... That, that I've been describing in my own life lately as what I would call an orienting relationship, okay? An orienting relationship. Uh, I feel like this is something that God's just kind of, th this terminology is something God's weaving into my heart, weaving into my life, weaving into my, my family's life. This terminology of an orienting relationship. This is what Paul's describing here. Now, what is an orienting relationship? Let me ask you, let me explain it to you this way. Do we have any parents in the room? Any parents? Okay, a few, all right. Now, parents, let's think about this for just a second. An orienting relationship is where you have a relationship with someone or something that is so life-changing that your life becomes oriented around that person, right? The best way I know to explain this to you is when you bring a baby home from the hospital, all right? Any, parent, any parents remember what that's like, right? I remember what this is like. I was 22 years old when, I, when we had Danny, okay? 22 years old, and they handed me this like six pound baby, right? And they said, Take her home, right? And I was like, No. Like, can we stay here, right? Because, like, I don't know what to do with this, right? Like, I'm not even sure how this works, right? And so they gave us this six pound baby, told us to take her home, and here's what happened. And my, new mamas, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about here, right? Over the next two weeks, six weeks to like six months, your life became about one thing. What did your life become about? That baby. Changing diapers, fixing bottles, figuring out why they're crying, changing more diapers, right? Your life became about fit this, this child that was in front of you. What happened? You had an orienting relationship. That in this moment, there was this, this being that was completely dependent upon you. And because of that, your life became oriented around that baby. That's what Paul's describing here. 
Except in this case, we're not, or God's not dependent on us. We're dependent on him. And our entire life becomes oriented around him. That's what it means to be a Christian to Paul. Paul has none of this, well, to have a relationship with Jesus means you come down here, say a prayer, go on about your life, and you have a relationship, right? No, what Paul is saying, that life is all about Jesus. Paul says, for me, life, Christ. So let me ask you this. Do you have this kind of relationship with Jesus where all of your life is oriented around him? Because this is what it means. This is what it means. But he doesn't just stop here. He actually... He actually said, goes on and further explains this a little bit by another statement. He says, for, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So the second thing we, way we can answer this, what does it mean to be a Christian? That we can say this, death is gain. Now, can we just talk for just a second about how oxymoronic a statement this is? Death is gain? Like, no, Paul, generally death is loss, Right? Like that's, how, that's how this thing works. But de- look, we need to go ahead and lay this out. Death can only be gained when life is Christ. Okay? Track, track with me here, okay? Paul does not say life is marriage. Paul does not say life is kids. Paul does not say life is uh, career. Paul does not say life is family. Paul does not say life is finances. Li- Paul does not say life is relationships. What does Paul say? Paul says, life is Christ. Now, if life is Christ, then death is gain. Why? Because we get to go be with Jesus. Now, the the inverse of this is also true. If life is relationships, right? If life is marriage, if life is kids, if life is career, then death is loss. Why? Because it's taking you away from all of those things. But Paul says, no, if life is Christ and none of those things, then death is actually gain. Now, how can this be true? This can only be true if Jesus is better than all of those things. Notice what he says. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. This is what he says. I am hard-pressed between the two. Between what? Between life and death. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. Now, stop there for a second. If you, were ha- if you come to my office, right, and you say to me, Dallas, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, at that point, I am a mandatory reporter. I've got to fill out a paper, some paperwork on you, right? To depart, like, do you want to die? What is wrong with you, right? Like, pastorally, I've got to do that. I'm like, great, this guy's just told me he's suicidal, right? Let me go ahead and do what i got to do. I'm Like, I'm making light of that, but that's serious. Like, the, if we met somebody who was talking this way, we'd be like, man, this dude is crazy. To depart is your desire? But notice why this is not crazy. What's he say? For that is far better. You see what Paul's saying here? See, according to Paul, this is logical. Life is Christ. Life is not marriage. Life is not career. Life is not relationships. Life is not fun. Life is Christ because Christ is better than anything else life has to offer. You see, we get mixed up a little bit on what Christianity is sometimes, okay? Christianity is not just good news because Jesus saves us from something bad. Okay, and that, that's true. Jesus does save us from something bad. Can we all agree that hell is bad? Jesus saves us from that? That's awesome. Christianity is not just good news because Jesus saves us from something bad. Christianity is good news because Jesus saves us, and as our Savior, he is better than anything else we could have had otherwise. You see, what Paul is saying to us here is that Jesus is better than anything else life could possibly offer. So when Paul says, what what does it mean to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? What Paul actually says is, oh, no, I don't still have a relationship. What Paul's saying is that uh, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ is to have a relationship where you believe that Jesus is better than anything else this world can offer you. That's why he's everything to you. So the question becomes, do we have that kind of relationship? Jesus is better, Paul says. Now, as we think about this, can I just tell you, For me, that's hard. 
Like, and it, it, like, listen, if you're honest with yourself, you should be saying the same thing. Because when I hear Jesus is better, my immediate response is like, better than what? Right? B- it, better, than, better than everything? That's, what, that's the route you're going to go here, Paul? Jesus is better than everything? And now listen, if Paul was saying this and he was 87, I could get it, right? Like at 87, let's be honest, you've done all that you're going to do, right? But I'll, I'll be 27 on Tuesday, right? And here's what I know at 27. I still got a lot of life ahead of me, right? There's a lot of things that I still want to do. Like I can get it if you're Steve's age and you're saying, hey, to depart, be with Jesus, right? You, Steve's done it. I'm just kidding. Steve's not at all. But you you see what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of life that when you're saying to depart and be with Jesus is better than anything else this life can offer. I start to push back a little little bit on that, right? Because I'm like better than, I've I've been married seven years. I hope to get 47 more out of it. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm in this thing for the long haul. Like you're telling me, Paul, that Jesus is better than what God, than what the next 47 years of marriage can offer me? And listen, I started to push back a little bit on that. Oh, man, Jesus has got to be really good then because that seems like I'm giving up a lot to say Jesus is better than that, right? And then I started thinking, like, Jesus is better than, like, my little girl, right? And now, listen, Dad's in here. Happy Father's Day because here's one. I never, man, I'm 27, right? You're just so young, and I'm just foolish and don't even know what's out there. But, man, check this out. My little girl at nighttime, sometimes she gets scared and she'll, say, she'll call me, right? And she'll say, Daddy, I want you to come lay with me for a second. And I'll lay with her and get her back to bed. And when I do, I hug her. And let me just tell you something. That's, that's good stuff. Dad, you know what I'm talking about? Like, that's good stuff. Like, I could tear down buildings off of that power, right? There, there's just not a whole lot better. And Paul, what Paul's saying here is that to depart and be with Jesus is better than getting to walk my little girl down the aisle one day. And man, just start to push back a little bit on this. And, but here's the deal. As I thought about this, as I, as I thought, like, Jesus, are you really that good? Here's what I realized. And my wife was in here in the first service. I said the same thing with her in here. Here's what I realized. That this absolutely has to be true. Because here's the deal. I've been married for seven years. My wife's the best thing that ever happened to me. You know what my wife hadn't done in seven years? Satisfied my soul. You don't know why? She just wasn't made to. She's, she, she's, that's not her job, right? And listen, as much as I love my little girl and as much as I cannot wait for the day when I get to walk her down the aisle, here's the deal. My little girl don't satisfy my soul. As a matter of fact, there are some days like yesterday where she does anything but satisfy my soul, <laughs> right? And here's, here's, here's what, I, what, what I started to realize, that human experience is teaching us that this is true. That as good as everything this world may have to offer us is, right, there is nothing that can satisfy our soul, which is why this statement has to be true, that life is Christ because Jesus is better than anything this life has to offer. And Jesus would actually put it this way. Matthew 13, verse 44, Jesus would actually say it this way. He's telling a parable. And Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What's he saying? He says, Coming to Jesus, following Jesus, doesn't mean that all those other things are no longer any good. They're just not as good as what Jesus offers. So what it means to be a Christian is that we leave behind what is good to have what is best, right? And we have all this good stuff in our life and we hold it loosely because we understand that as good as any of this stuff is, Jesus is better. And I love, I love the way it says it here because it says in his joy, he went and sold what? All that he had. Now, here's what I love about that. He had to have some pretty good stuff, right? Can you imagine him coming home to his wife and he's like, sell it all, baby. And he's like, hey, she's like, we worked for years to have this house. We worked for years to have this stuff. We worked for years and you want us to sell it all? And he's like, I got something that's better. You see, the Bible doesn't say here that he didn't leave behind what's good 
Yeah, he had some good stuff. The Bible's telling us here that he left behind what was good to have what is best. And what is best is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because in that relationship, here's what we have. We have something better in Jesus than the world could ever offer us. That's what it means that Jesus is his treasure. That's what it means that life is Christ and death is gain. So Paul's sitting here in this prison cell, and he's been writing. He's in, Imagine all that Paul's done. Paul's planted churches. Paul's seen people come to Christ. Paul's led people to the Lord. He's done so much work, and here's what he says. For me, life is Jesus, and death is gain. And that's what it means to be a Christian. So what I'm asking you this morning is not simply do you have a relationship with Jesus. What I'm asking you is what Paul's telling us is do you have a relationship with Jesus where Jesus is better to you than anything else in the world such that death is gain because it means you get to go be with Jesus. So this morning I want to just close out and challenge us with this. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have that kind of relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've never found that Jesus is better than anything else. I would just challenge you to do this morning what the man did with the field. To leave behind what is good so that you can have what is best. To leave behind all that the world offers that may even be good things to say, Jesus, you're better than me than anything else. To take these stuff, to take these things in our life, like our marriages, which are good. I'm going to love my wife to the day I die. Hear me say that, all right? I'm going to love my kid to the day I die. But to hold that stuff loosely, because we understand that as good as it is, it'll never satisfy my soul like Jesus will. If that's you today, I would love to pray with you about how you can leave behind what is good, surrender your life, die to yourself, and follow Jesus with all that you are. For those of us who do have that kind of relationship, the the call is simply this. Let us not forget what Paul knew, that to be a Christian means that all of life is about Jesus. Would you pray with me? Dear church, dear God, I'm thankful for this church. God, I'm thankful uh, for this campus specifically, Lord. I'm thankful for what you've done in this campus over the past three years. Dear Lord, God, when I came When I came to Upstate Church Harrison Bridge, dear God, Upstate Church Five Fours didn't even exist yet, God. And Lord, I'm just thankful for the work that you've done, even in the past three years, to reach this community for Jesus. And God, I pray that we would remember what is true all the more, that you are better than anything this world has to offer. And because of that, you're worth losing everything else for. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.